Greetings, good afternoon, and welcome everyone um, for joining us for our private donor event. Um, giving thanks to all of you for participating in our acquisition campaign in honor of the 50th anniversary of the Renwick Gallery and the 40th anniversary of the Alliance, which officially just happened on Saturday. So I saw some of you on Saturday. Um, today, Mariko Kuzumoto is going to be speaking about her work and showing us um, kind of a little bit behind the scenes. She is, of course, one of the artists that we selected for the uh, acquisition, for a acquisition at the Renwick Gallery. Um, following her talk, JG, our president and the chair of the acquisition campaign is going to be leading a question and answer. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, also in the chat, you can say hello. You can welcome uh, Leela. Leela is our newest staff member, as I mentioned. Um, Leela, if you just want to give a quick wave again, um, you'll see a lot more of her in the future. So if you'd like to give welcomes, you can do that in the chat as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to invite Mariko to um, give a talk. OK. Uh, thank you so much for the, this great opportunity to talk about my work today. I feel very honored that my piece has become part of the Rainwick Gallery's collections. It is a great, great achievement for me. Uh, thank you so much again to everybody who made this happen. So, um, my English isn't great, but I hope you can bear with me until the end. Okay, I'm going to show my slides. I'm going to share screen. Okay, can you see? Okay. So first I would like to talk about a little about my childhood. Growing up in a temple that was founded 400 years ago, I was always surrounded by the beauty of nature and ancient things like faded paint on wood and stone steps with hollows created by centuries of raindrops dripping off the roof. I was always um, fascinated by the elaborate metal and wood ornaments made by skilled craftsmen that were freestanding, attached to surfaces, or hanging from the ceiling throughout the temple. When the gleam of the gold colored ornaments would emerge from the darkness, I could sense the spiritual world and its eternal silence. As a child, I spent a lot of time outside, especially in the temple's graveyard, playing with dirt, insect, plants, etc. I was pretty much a, a nature girl. I was always making things with whatever materials were available, such as my mother's fabric, paper, and plants, and I also drew. I've always had a creative inclination. Now, when I was 15, I decided to become an artist, so I went to a secondary school with um, offering a fine art major. There, I learned about art in general, such as painting, sculpture, design, and also art history. I really had a great time, and then I went to an art college after that. So I was determined to be an artist from an early age. Metal has been a familiar material to me since I was a child. Polishing the elaborate metal ornaments in the altars in my temple was one of my chores. So I was always interested in metal. When I entered art college in Japan, my major was oil painting. And then I changed to a printmaking major, focusing on etching. In the etching class, I learned uh, photo etching techniques. I found myself more fascinated by the etched metal than 
by the images printed on paper. After I took a small metal sculpture classes, um, after moving to the USA, I started to make three-dimensional metal sculptures using the photo etching technique. And these are the uh, etched brass and the etched uh, nickel silver. So after I worked with metal for about 18 years, and then I started to work with fabric about eight years ago. So I selected some metal work where you can see the etching technique. All my metal sculptures are interactive. There are a lot of moving parts, surprising, surprises, and you might hear music sometimes. You never know what will happen until you interact with my pieces. Uh, this is uh, about a sushi restaurant. Each one of the sushi piece has surprising piece, pieces inside. Uh, the piece, um, and the pieces go inside this bento box and the box can be stored on the back of the restaurant. Everything become compact. This piece is now the collection of Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And these are all, all um, etched brass and etched copper. This is a game piece. Uh, brooches. So every piece in this photo has moving parts. The sewing machine needles goes up and down. The boy on the horse does acrobatics and the characters in the theater move from side to side, etc. As I mentioned, Metal sculpture had been my main focus since 1995, but in 2013, after completing a very involved and technically challenging piece, I felt the need to move away from using purely representational imagery and do something more abstract, organic, and with a different material. The result has been my fabric work. Fabric is the completely opposite of metal. And I like the softness, gentle texture, and atmospheric qualities of the fabric I use, especially its translucency. I feel that there are a lot of possibilities in this material, and there are things that only can be achieved with fabric. I was invited to um, collaborate with Jean-Paul Gaultier for his spring 2019 Paris runway show. Getting involved in the fashion field was never my intention, so I was very shocked. However, until I worked on this project, I was very ignorant about fashion world. I thought the fashion field is far removed from what I do, totally different field. I thought that the fashion field was <coughs> superficial and a flashy world. However, as I learned more about the top fashion designers, including Rei Kawakubo, et cetera, <coughs> I realized that the way they think and their process of creation is not any different from the other art fields like sculpture. So this experience confirmed for me that this really no boundary between art forms. So I'm going to talk now about how this collaboration came to be. <clears throat> Gautier participated in the Met Gala in May 2018. And while in New York, he stopped by the MoMA Museum store. And at that time, I had some pieces there for sale, and this is my brooch. And uh, a few months later, um, 
I received an email from an assistant that said, <clears throat> I work for Jean Mr. Jean-Paul Gaultier, who bought your works in New York at MoMA store. He would be very interested in collaboration with you for his next, next couture show in January 2019. <clears throat> Thank you in advance for letting me know if that would interest you and how we can proceed. That was the beginning of our collaboration. <clears throat> After I shipped all the pieces that they had requested, my husband and I received an invitation to attend Gaultier's Spring Summer 2019 show for Paris Fashion Week. I was very impressed with the elaborate pleated card and how closely they pay attention to every detail. We arrived in Paris. It was very interesting to see the room inside Gaultier's building. There is a room just for the Gaultier's kitchen. There is a studio specializing just in hats and wigs a room for music and film editing, a huge space for the runway, a display room for his, his creations for making presentation to clients, etc. And there are rooms for everything. It seemed like he could do everything from the beginning to the end inside his building. I was very excited to meet him and spend time with him. He was a very nice, friendly person. We arrived there a few days before the show, and I had a chance to work directly with Gaultier and his team and see this workspace. This is on the day of the fashion show. In front of the building was a traffic jam with celebrities getting out of car, stopping all of the traffic, total chaos. Many of the celebrities were wearing Gaultier's dresses. Uh, I contributed to 18 out of 63 looks in the show, those that had a Japan and marine theme. I've selected some images of the look that feature my contributions. In this photo, he was using the inside of the obi for the outside, and it was done intentionally. The concept at the core of his work is everything has beauty. He finds beauty in unexpected places, and using the wrong side of obi is an example. As you know, his work is known for its avant-garde quality. He combines things which seemingly doesn't match, but he has the ability to create new possibilities, generate energy, and make it his own style. People love his eclecticism. One of the look from collaboration called Big in Japan was acquired by Museum of Fine Art Boston for their permanent collection. And this is the detail. And these are the instructions I received, which shows how we communicated. There are so many of them, 
And the instructions, um, there is a number for each loop. Sometimes I receive actual pieces of fabric so that I could match the colors. Gautier specified the fabric and the pieces he wanted to attach. So I could see only the colors that are in the fabric. I could use only the colors that, I, that are in the fabric. Sometimes I came up with the ideas and the suggested the pieces which could match the atmosphere of the fabric that he specified. This is his drawing. And these are the pieces in progress. Gautier really liked the pieces I provided and he graciously sent this photo to me. And these are the pieces in progress. And this is the last photo of the adventure. It was very uh, memorable and precious experience of my career. Uh, it was a new discovery for me. Working with other people shows me different perspectives, possibilities, and I, I learned a lot from this experience. Now I'd like to show some other collaboration, La Mer. Currently, I'm working with Elizabeth Arden. I just shipped many pieces to them uh, last week in New York to be used in the marketing campaign. I'm just renting the pieces so they will be coming back. Um, I take my own photos of my work and I license the images sometimes. So these are the LP and CD cover for an album that just came out this month. The band is called Low Island and they are based in the UK. I'm very fond of the, this band's music. Now I'm showing my brooches. The interesting things about my work is depending on what it's worn with or background, my pieces look different because of the translucent color. If the background, background is black, light color pop up, but on the white background, the dominant color is switched. In this way, the background color creates different atmosphere. And these sphere pieces are the pins. When you are not, when you are not wearing, using them, uh, you can display on the metal stand I made. For these pieces, I used traditional Japanese technique called tsumamizaiku, and I applied to my way. Uh, I will show in the demo later. red coral brooch. This bird brooch is made to be perched on your shoulder. Bracelet. Coral necklace. This is the Seascape One necklace that JRA Craft acquired. Thank you so much. This is the Seascape Two necklace that I was working on at the same time as the other one. Uh, this is a commissioned necklace for Lila Rose. You might have heard her name, but she's a New York fashion designer. 
she asked me to make a personalized necklace for her. She sent me a list of the things that she want me to be, she want me to include, such as bicycle, cowboy boots, her dog, needle and thread, button, uh, rose, etc. It is a story about her. I enjoy this project because I probably would never have made the bicycle, cowboy boots, unless I was asked to do so. Sea breeze necklace. The sensibility, subtlety, fragility, and ambiguity are the essential part of my work, and the fabric can achieve this element. Now I'm showing the sculpture pieces. The thing I like about my work is it's not hard to understand. I want to create something simply beautiful that speaks directly to the viewer, regardless, regardless of their age, race, gender, etc. I want the piece to be able to stand up by themselves without needing explanation. Simply beautiful sounds straightforward and easy to say, but it's not necessarily easy to do, I think. But needless to say, it's the most powerful and universal things. I am always surprised that how strongly people react to my work. People always describe my work as energizing, bringing joy, uplifting, ethereal, impalpable, etc. Et and they also say many people always talk to them whenever they wear my pieces. It may just be an object, but I like the way that it connects people. It's interesting to see how the object positively affect people's emotion and mind. Every time I hear those comments, I feel like what I'm doing is, is meaningful. This is the last photo. I hope you enjoy. Enjoyed. Thank you so much. I'm gonna. Thanks, Marika. Um, JG, do you want to? Um, well, I guess you want to do a demonstration and then we can do our Q&A. Does that sound okay? okay. All yes. right. Great. Okay, so I'm going to switch my camera. Okay, hold on a second. So Mariko has a pretty cool setup where she's going to actually show us up close some of these pieces that we were seeing in the slideshow and the different components of them. So when I went back to Japan for a vacation, uh, I accidentally found this book. It's about tsumami zaiku, which is a technique for making fabric flowers for hair ornaments worn with kimono. So this technique has been passed down through generation of craftsmen uh, since Edo period, which was uh, about 400 years ago. Um, I was very inspired and fascinated with this simple origami-like technique, which transforms into complex and beautiful pattern when it's combined. So this was got me first interested in fabric. Anyway, these are my creation. And I'm going to do demo on this. 
sorry, it's hard to focus. It's supposed to be old focus. But anyway, the technique is very simple. There are only two ways of foldings. One, um, one is pointy tip, and the other one is round tip like this. So there are only two different kinds, even though the piece looks very complicated. Okay, so, so I use those technique and come up with different ideas. So I went crazy about making flowers and I made so many of them. So now I show how I did it. And this is my favorite glue. Sorry, it's a bad word. But it's, uh, this is the same as a white glue, but uh, it's much thicker than white glue. So as I mentioned, there are two different way of folding square fabric. This is a paper. I, I'm doing this so it's easier to see. So you just fold three times. One two, uh, three, and that's it. This is one petal. Then I glue the tip and put hair pin and wait until it dries. The other one is I'm making pointy tip petal. One, two, three. It looks similar, but the difference is instead of two pointy uh, edge fold this way, or the other one is folding, you open up and fold this way. So just direction is a little bit different, but very similar. So this is the pointy flower petal. The other one, uh, if you push in the middle, it's become round. So this, that's the difference. So I already made the round petal for this. Then, Using toothpick, so it's not focusing. So I put glue on the bottom. So it focuses. I know, Mariko. It like does it for a second and then goes out of focus again. This is so cool, though. It's a autofocus. Yeah. So if I have too many things, I think camera get confused. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I put glue on the bottom and I always use tweezer because it's so small. Then I put it inside. And for the center, I use quarter inch fabric. I cut everything ahead of time. And for, so this is quarter inch. Then after that, for here, I use three quarter. And the rest of the places, I use one inch. And then, for the base, I use thick paper like this. You can use a cereal box. Anything hard, thick paper work. And that's it. Then I sh um, I sh show you different techniques. 
hold on one second. Yeah, this is so exciting. I'm getting like private messages in the chat saying this is awesome. <laughs> or this is just amazing. So thank you for sharing this with us. Oh, there you go. Uh, next technique I use very often for my work is it's called heat setting technique. So I'll show you how I form these shapes. Since after I made so many flowers, I wanted to explore more uh, techniques. And then I discovered about this heat setting technique. The things I like about this technique is when you heat this um, with mold uh, and heat it certain temperature, it's synthetic fab fabric like polyester, nylon, can memorize the shape permanently. So I was really, really excited about this technique. Uh, like your pleat skirt, it used the same technique. It always go back to the same shape because it's heat treated. So I use temperature somewhere around 400 uh, Fahrenheit for 20 minutes. You can either put it in the oven or um, steam or boil in the hot water. Okay, so I'll show you how I do it. And Mariko, I just got a question about um, what kind of fabric is this that you're using and that you were using in the previous one? Oh, the, for the fabric flower, I use silk. Okay. Well, you can use polyester, but if you use silk, the white glue works better, I think. But basically, you can use anything. But for heat setting technique, it has to be polyester or nylon. And I got this um, translucent fabric I ordered from Japan. Mm -hmm. But usually, um, I can buy fabric from Joanne Fabric Store. I go to thrift stores. You know, it's available anywhere, so it's not hard to get. I also go to um, fabric stores in New York. Great, thank you. And you, this time I'm gonna use the grass ball. I wrap around the ball with fabric and I hold it very tight. And then I use thread. and tie this very tight. It's like a shibori technique. Now it's ready to go. Very simple. And to make this, I use this disc, but you can use coins, anything you can use. But anyway, so, so I heat it uh, about 400 Fahrenheit for 20 minutes in the oven. So this is ready to remove the mold. So I cut the mold, I cut the thread. Now it's done. It's bounced back. And then I think I found this at the free market. I don't remember where I got this, but uh, I'm gonna put this inside. And then I glue this part and tie it with thread or something. Then it's done. Easy, right? So now I can talk about uh, mold. I will show you what you can use for the mold. Well, you certainly make it look easy, although <laughs> I don't know, people, people watching this, if you try it at home, please don't set your house on fire. And if you do, don't say you learned it from the Alliance. <laughs> 
Well, I'll show you different kinds of mold. So for the mold, you can use anything as long as the mold will melt in the oven. So plastic is not gonna work, but you can use wood. Um, this is a, I use plaster, actual stone and glass. I even use shells. And because I'm a metal smith, I make my own mold. So I made this. Then I made uh, earrings with this mold. So the interesting thing about metal mold is one's typical um, impression of fabric is it is soft, has flowing lines, and it's gentle, etc. But when, you, um, when I use a metal mold with crisp edge and rigid straight lines, and the fabric will pick up metal's characteristic very, very precisely. So you can almost see the metal inside even after the metal mold is removed. So people don't expect to see those uh, three-dimensional, very crisp edge and straight lines in soft fabric. So it is interesting to combine those opposite characteristic. And I like this unexpected effect. Sorry, it doesn't focus very well. But anyway, so I use this uh, metal mold. It's just a polyester. So anyway, uh, for this piece, I haven't completed yet, but I put uh, fabric uh, between paper and fold it like origami. And then it's become like that. So, so using this plaster mold, I made this. My, this is my treasure box. I use uh, minerals. You're surprised how much uh, detail on fabric can pick up. So people don't know, people always ask me, what is it? What kind of material? So that's a compliment for me. And so these little treasures, would they then be put together into like a brooch? And then are you sewing them together? Are you gluing them together? I'm, uh, I, I grew, it's depend on the piece. If I grew everything, it's become very stiff. So instead I use uh, invisible threads sometimes, but it's depend on the pieces. But I made a big necklace using this, or I could use this for sculpture pieces. Okay, I'm gonna show one more technique. Great, and just remember if anyone has questions, um, Mariko's gonna be taking questions at the end, so you can put those in the chat. Oh, I forgot to show. For this piece, I used a little uh, bead, like a ball shape. 
Anyway, I found this coral uh, um, at the free market, and I wanted to make something like this. In the slide, I show a uh, coral necklace. This is, I was inspired from this. So the way I made was, first I use uh, fabric stiffener uh, so that I can fold the fabric. Without fabric stiffener, I cannot fold. So these are all stiff. And then I cut this shape one by one and I connect all together from this shape. So it's really, really time consuming. I fold it like this. And then I stitch them. So clever. Yes, I'm thinking of making a big sculpture using this technique in the future. So, okay, I'm done with my demo. Do you Great. have any questions? Yeah, do you want to switch your camera back um, to where it was before? And then we, um, I'm going to invite JG to ask uh, any questions he may have. Um, and then if anyone on the call yeah. also has some. Okay, I will. Thank you. We'll wait till you're back on camera. There we go. There we go. So it's really delightful to, to see your work and your technique. And I, I think about the patience required to do that. And it's very impressive to me. I usually um, don't have a lot of patience, when, but when it comes to creation, I have a lot of patience. Yeah. So uh, a few questions that we, we wanted to start with. And, and the first is, can you tell us about how the Renwick Gallery curators first contacted you and what about your work that was that interested them? Yeah, okay. Uh, in January last year, um, I got an email from a curator, Mary, Mary Savi, I, I cannot pronounce yeah. her last name. Yeah. But, and she wrote, uh, I'm curious to learn of any available jewelry, particularly the work that evoke coral and mineral marine forms. So at that time, I didn't have any uh, marine theme pieces available. So I told her I would make a new one, new pieces. Then, um, so that's what happened. So I, after I completed, I sent her a lot of photos and I shipped my pieces and then it was accepted. Yeah, that's the story. So they were interested in the marine pieces? Huh? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. So you, you've described your work as happy and playful. Mm -hmm. So what, what inspires you to make that kind of work? Uh, whenever I create things, uh, I'm, I feel very positive. And uh, I'm so excited about so many ideas. And uh, I like the state of mind. So um, that kind of feeling is reflected in my pieces and uh, people can feel it through my artwork, I think. Yeah. And, and so what, what's coming next? Are there new directions you'd like to explore? Um, exhibitions you have, you mentioned one earlier. Yes, um, next fall, I'm going to have an exhibition at the Morikami Museum and Japanese Garden where uh, they gave me a huge space. So I'm currently, I'm working on uh, wear, wearable pieces and the larger scale sculpture pieces. So working on larger pieces require more time. And since the fabric is soft, I have to think about how I support these shapes. So it's going to be a, a, a challenging, but I'm sure it's going to open a new door for me. So I'm very excited about that. Yeah, that's my future plan. 
yeah. sounds like a lot of work to do. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. So if anybody else has questions, you can put them in the chat and we can pass them along. Okay, um, Mariko, can you see the chat? You might want to look at it yourself too while I'm... So the question is, for the more detailed textures pieces, the fabric settle or melt down into the details of the mold? Is there a melting point for the fabric that you have to be careful about? Um, you know, the, the oven I use, um, it's extremely precise. So depend on the pieces, depend on fabric, I have a different setting. I did mm. I do a lot of experiment and then some um, some fabric I have to make it lower because it turns yeah, yellow or this color. So some um, nylon's melting point is much lower than polyester. So sometimes I stick to the uh, mold. But because of those uh, experiments, I know exact temperature, the big list of temperature. So, yeah. If we don't have any other questions, I think we um, can say thank you. Okay. Well, to you for being here. JG, do you want to say a few thanks um, to conclude us today? Yes. This, this program was only possible because of the generosity of all the donors to the 50th Anniversary Acquisition Fund. Um, it was a smashing success that it was because of all of you, and it meant we could bring work like Mariko's into the collection. This is the first piece in the collection, and six of the seven artists who we brought in, it was their first piece, and it hadn't been in the collection before, so we're, we're very excited about that. And I'm really excited to see what you're going to do with larger scale. I can, I can only imagine these pieces are fantastic at the current scale, so I think they're going to be fantastic, even more fantastic larger. And, and thank you so much, Mariko. We're thrilled to have you and thrilled to be able to support your piece going with the collection. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This opportunity.